Welcome to World of Marketing Podcast, a Foster Web Marketing production. Here's your host, Tom Foster. Hey everybody, it's Tom Foster, and here we are on the World of Marketing. And here I am with my good buddy, Frank Lunn. Hey Tom. How are you, pal? Fantastic. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to have you here. Me too. I told you that I was feeling um, some guilt. Let me help close some of those down. I got things popping up. Very distracting. Can't have all these distracting distractions yeah. when I'm talking to you. <clears throat> Us entrepreneurs, you know, we have to be careful of all the squirrels that are running by. So if you see my eyes dart. Uh, well, speaking of your background is very, got a lot of cool stuff going on back there. <laughs> I like the warrior thing. So I was the other day I was thinking, damn, man, Frank, <laughs> my buddy, I got to get him on here because uh, I talked to, I've talked to Sam. Mm -hmm. I've talked to Dave, obviously. I talked to Sam twice, Dave twice. I heard you with Dr. Um, Wyman. Um, yeah, Dave Wyman. Yeah. And um, I'm like, Frank is going to be mad. <laughs> so well, timing is perfect. Yeah, you because you've just kind of come out of your hole, right? A little bit, yeah. Because I mean, of this pandemic, it, it's weird, but in a in a strange way, um, you know, there's definitely been some blessings in this adversity, and you know, I wouldn't wish it on anybody, and we certainly can't change it. We're living in interesting times for sure, but at the same time, you know, we we have choices, and um, yeah. some of the choices that we were left with as entrepreneurs is to okay, we're either going to make things work and, and work for the benefit of other people, or we're going to be victims. And I, I'm not hip on being a victim. So regardless, you know, it's, let's take some action. And what's the entrepreneur opportunities that we have in this? And so it's not been perfect, but it's certainly been, uh, in some ways, a way to recalibrate and to, to take a, a new look and a fresh look at where we are and where we want to go. And that was really good and beautiful. And that's one of the great things about Frank and why I wanted to have Frank on the show and what you guys just heard. He's a different kind of guy. Um, you know, Frank is a serial entrepreneur. Uh, and um, he has, uh, well, you have a, to say it in the simplest terms, uh, your company, Kahuna Accounting. Mm -hmm. Uh, does accounting and financial planning help uh, mentoring mindset for a lot of law firms, mostly lawyers, you'll say? Yeah, absolutely. A lot of lawyers and, and other, you know, practice builders and, and entrepreneurs. Um, but it's more than just will do your books. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing about you. It's, it's like, well, how, you know, it's really, yeah, sure. We did got your book. And it's a lot like me, you know, we talk about this all the time, like, <laughs> but that's not really what it's about. It's right. about what are your goals? How are you trying to grow your business? Um, and let's make sure that the money is working towards that. Right. right? We get so caught up in the tool. Sometimes we forget. Yeah that a tool has a purpose uh, just like a vehicle has a purpose and different missions. And we get caught just like a website had the website is a tool for exactly yeah. same thing. That's why it's very similar. But if you don't know what your purpose, so is my purpose right. to get customers? Is it to just build brands? Is it to make people laugh? Is it to, you know, to be able to sell things, to connect people? If you don't know what the purpose is, the tool gets lost in, in that. And I think, that's the thing. So the misnomer, the funny thing for me about accounting is I hate accounting. Um, <laughs> I didn't understand it. I'm not an accountant. I'm not a CPA. Um, I came into this very backwards because, um, you know, as, as you know, and we'll share a little bit of the background is I started out in the ATM business. Um, so you get a lot of teas like make it rain. The ATM. Well, before that you're in the army. Okay. Right. I was in the army. Um, so, Back it up, because there's yeah. a lot of people that, that would appreciate that, and thank you for your service. Thank you, and yours. Yeah. 
So um, I was back in uh, Desert Storm and mm -hmm. I was actually trained as an armor officer. And when I went to, um, when the war started back in August of, of 90, um, I was just finishing my officer's basic school down at Fort Knox, Kentucky, and I was gung ho. I'd been through airborne school. You know, I thought, you know, I'm, I'm going to go to war and this is going to be something. And when I got sent over, I was actually put with a unit um, related to transportation, the loading and offloading of the vehicles and the boats. And I mean, it was all logistics. And I was so frustrated about it because you know, I'm in my 20s and, you know, again, gung ho as possible. And I'm dealing with operations and logistics on the port of Dammam in Saudi Arabia. And I was like, oh, this is terrible. Um, it turned out to be a, a, a huge blessing. And even though the war only lasted like two days, um, the operational piece lasted a considerable amount of time. And I was shocked with how much I didn't know I didn't know. Um, I'd always been good in sales and, and my whole background prior to that. I mean, I'd sold life insurance. I'd sold a number of things, radio advertising. And I always wanted to be an entrepreneur and I thought, you know, sales is it. And I, I really was humbled by how much goes into operations and logistics and beans and bullets. Um, you know, if you've got um, army dogs or Marine jarheads, whatever you have, nothing happens if you don't have the people behind making sure people are fed, have a place to sleep, um, get paid, you know, little things like that. So, sure. so I was humbled that the first time and got out of that and <clears throat> got married and, moved up to the Chicago area and live in Illinois right now and um, had a little bit of a brief entrepreneur opportunity with a partner and that went bust quickly. So I ended up having to get a job because I had a family. And so I was a district manager for a, uh, a large uh, oil and, and gas um, convenience store chain. And it was a miserable job because I don't really, I don't smoke, I don't drink and I don't play lottery. And that was like 90% of the revenue piece. I, I did get gas, but, but it was, that was another, you know, logistical piece where I, I didn't enjoy it, but man, it gave me a lot of great foundation. Okay. But wait a minute. Like, so you, uh, I remember this, this is great stuff. It just showed, you said it, you kind of fell into it and it yeah. just shows how, and you and I have a very similar story like this because how we just kind of like tumbled down the road Yep. And like took what we could get. We have families. I mean, we're the same age and we yep. have families that we had to take care of. I mean, you were in the army. I was in the Marines. Uh, we get out and we're like, holy shit, what do we do? Right. Um, and you like, so you got a partner and you started what basically a convenience store, right? You, well, you owned one or? No, no like this business was before that. So I was just a, a I was a district manager for Clark Oil in Chicago. Okay. Um, this was, so my entrepreneur stint lasted from about November uh, to February. I mean, it was like a four month and I was going to, I was brought in to be a district manager for a sales office in Chicago Got it. in Dallas. Well, something happened with their funding and it fell apart. And by the time I got the office set up in Chicago, got my wife moved in and, and she was ready to have our first child, Frankie. Um, this was back in 1993 and yeah. that business went out. So I had to find a job. And so all of a sudden I'm like, Oh my gosh. So I found a job as a district manager for a convenience store chain, Clark oil in the Chicago area. And, and that's where I eventually I had 35 stores that I was managing and, and leading and it was miserable for me. It wasn't my passion. It wasn't my purpose, but. So did you have to go uh, around into the different stores yep. and check on them? And, and like your job was to manage the managers of those stores. It was setting pricing for gas. It was the marketing. It was being able to. Dealing with the employees. Right. Helping them with hiring, helping them with um, their inventories and loss prevention and other things. And it was, it was not a lot of fun, but again, it was another one of those. Well, you learned a lot. I did. I learned a lot. Again, more about that operational logistics, yeah. owning um, things that I didn't really, you know. How more long did you do that? How long did you do that? For about three and a half years. Um, wow. And then I grew up in the central Illinois area and decided that I didn't really want to grow up. And with my, with my new family in the Chicago area, south side of Chicago. So we moved back to central Illinois and Bloomington, Illinois is where I went to college. And so I was still a district manager here and I had 35 stores throughout the state. And it was, I mean, I was leaving at 4.30 in the morning and getting home at seven o'clock at night. And I had a pager with me. And I remember this really before cell phones. 
and that pager still, I have a little bit of like, you know, <laughs> when, I hear, when I hear a pager, I like PTSD about the oh page. Gosh. Yeah. So, cause it was never, no, nobody ever pages you for something good. Like, hey, no, right. Yeah. You know, it was like checking on you. Oh. How are you? Yeah. Got another robbery in Kankakee. It's like, oh. I remember when those first came out and I got one, I was so excited to get one. Like, <laughs> oh, wow. You know, like yeah. somebody can reach you right away. That's like, awesome. tell you to call, tell you to call them. Right. Oh, call this number. Yeah. How bizarre is that? Think about that tech. Like yeah. that was like, a whole gizmo dedicated to telling you to call somebody back. Right. So this was like 1995 Funny. and I kept my day job, but I had another partner that I had gone to college with and he had started a business called Community Merchant Services, uh, CMS. And it was a merchant search setting business up to take credit cards because back in the 90s, they didn't have a lot of uh, credit card opportunities, especially in the outside of the metropolitan areas. And so, um, as I they were still doing that job, paper business, yeah, that big whack, whack. knuckle buster. So yeah. I kept my job at Clark oil. Um, and I was district manager, but I would come in at four o'clock in the morning to do the accounting for this new startup business and the operational pieces that I knew the logistical pieces and then just do that on the weekends. And, and about two years in, I realized that there was something else coming in. And, and I saw this in the convenience store industry. I saw ATMs away from banks. And I thought, you know, if this ATM thing works out, it could be the big kahuna. And that's where kahuna came from. And it was- You hear that? Yeah. That's and, where the name comes from. Yeah. And you think about that, folks. Yeah. It think was, about that thinking when uh, a young man sees ATMs and everybody remembers when they first started yeah. seeing them in convenience stores and like, what I can get, I can get money right here. What? Yeah. Well, and, and so what happened and again, kind of another challenge was we started this business and had no money and to buy these ATMs, you know, at the time they were, you know, $20,000, you know, at the end of the, like now you can buy them for a couple thousand dollars. But, but when you're first starting out, we couldn't really afford to compete. So what we did was we found ourselves trying to act in the middle as a value added aggregator. And I went to a couple of the distributors, the manufacturers, and I basically just said, look, if you'll give me better pricing and some terms, then I'll be able to work with all these smaller companies across the country and aggregate pricing and buying power. And that's really how Kahuna got started. And we, um, built a fairly large ATM network, um, a lot of affiliate distributors and sales organizations, and they were all independent, but they could buy through us and we could provide processing, we could provide vault cash, we could provide equipment and software and all of these things that really were very fragmented. And so the, the challenge was we didn't have enough money to compete, so we took that and, and made it into an advantage of just being in the middle. And being in the middle was much better and we built it into a $20 million revenue company. Um, this is where kind of accounting comes in. I could care less about accounting. I had a CFO and, you know, we're doing all these things, $20 million. That's so awesome. But not really paying attention that our margins were razor thin and that we were really always focusing on growth because we get to another break point and we could make a quarter penny more on 10 million transactions. And so we're always chasing volume and revenue and growth and missing some of the other things. So what happened to me was, you know, in 2000. How long did you do that? Well, I started the business in 1997 officially. Um, that's when I quit my job and did this full time and it turned into Kahuna Business Group. And really in 2011, we were, I was on top of the world. I mean, it was, it was good. We were one of the top distributors in the country. Um, again, great revenue, had a fantastic team, bought a new building, 20,000 square foot building, um, had just all kinds of moving parts. And I thought, you know, this is, this is- Did you have an entourage? Uh, kind of. I mean, it was- um, Did you have a jet? Did you have like a no, jet? Not, not yet. That, that's the next act. Um, we'll come back to that. Um, but what we found was that- um, the business that we had built was really not as solid as I thought it was because I was just so enamored with revenue. And what happened was, is we had a client that was one of our biggest clients and we'd helped them grow. We'd, you know, really given them some strong uh, advantages. 
and they decided they wanted to sell. And I got the call and I'll never forget where they said, guess what? You're selling too. I said, no, I'm not. I'm never selling. And I'd never thought about that. And it was one of those choices where if we didn't sell, their chunk of business would have caused us to, you know, a cascading negative effect of pricing and other things. And so basically I was forced to sell and we went through this process, this business valuation process at the time. So we'd already decided we had to sell and, you know, it would be exciting because it'd be a, you know, a, a nice seven figure exit, even though I thought it could be worth more. Went through this valuation process and it was like 15 grand and it was like a, a lobotomy combined with a colonoscopy combined with something else. It was terrible. Um, only to find out that the value was significantly less, like four or five million dollars less than we thought it was. And but by the time we had gone through this, we couldn't affect any changes. It was already done. It was just a snapshot of here's where you are, and it's a take it or leave it. And so we took it, and even though we celebrated and you know, and it was great, I left five million dollars, four million dollars on the table at least. And I'm just kind of like smiling on the outside, crying on the inside, because I, all of these mistakes were mistakes that I just didn't know what I didn't know. And again, as entrepreneurs, as marketers, we just think growth, more clients. And, and there's so much that I had to learn the hard way. Like, and I know that that still tortures you to this day. It does. I'm, I'm much more at peace. I mean, it makes a great story and I can get myself amped up. You know, I kind of catch myself in the corner, rocking back and forth. I, <laughs> sucking your thumb. But, but accounting was something that I just didn't care about. I, I abdicated, you know, there's a big difference between delegating. What a lesson. For, like, I hope everybody listens to that because that is a very common problem and a very common for lawyers too. I mean, absolutely that are not paying it because they don't pay attention to the numbers. Yeah. Unlike you, Logue, I, I can't stand that. Yeah, I have had problems in my past, as you know, with that. And, uh, you know, I got a team I can trust now, thank God. Oh, yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, it's, uh, uh, if you're not paying attention, that can, that can kill you. Well, here's a, kind of an analogy that people might understand. So I know you're a Star Trek fan, the original. Um, yep. Buried alive. Buried alive. Come! So imagine, you know, the USS Enterprise just kind of going around and bumping into stars and stuff. I mean, it doesn't really work out well. So just drifting in space is not, not a big thing that uh, usually is, works out for the, for the best. So when Captain Kirk says, you know, Mr. Sulu set a course and he has a, a destination in mind. And what, what hit me about accounting was for most of us, myself included, you know, I'm, I'm the chief of the mistake makers in this was just think about it as a past and looking at it for where have we been instead of a dynamic guidance a system of saying where am i now and where do i want to go and so how do we help entrepreneurs and, and business owners uh, legal professional practice builders to understand you know align and calibrate and coordinate what's important to them their mission their vision yeah. their their goals and ambition and use accounting as that tool so it's not just a where have you been, but where are you going? Mr. Sulu set a course for kicking ass, you know, and how do we use accounting as a system to do that? It's not about software. I mean, we're agnostic about that. My whole thing right now is helping entrepreneurs and business owners and practice builders make fewer mistakes than I've made. And the biggest thing is just having a target. Um, we have a target in everything else. We have a target in what we want our marketing to do, what our website should do. But we have kind of vague ideas of, I want to build value and create wealth. Well, what the hell does that mean? Well, and in mindset, you got to have the right mindset and you've got to, you've got to uh, take action. I mean, like, you know, Frank, you know, this better than anybody taking action on it, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, you and I have known each other for many years Absolutely. and we go hang out every <laughs> year, uh, at the uh, business black ops with Dave Freeze and a bunch yes. of other entrepreneurs. What a man. Yep. And we talk about this 
taking action and everybody beats up on each other. Some of us have done better than others. And, but it is a common uh, thing that happens to every business person is just like, Mm -hmm. but you're right. I mean, it is. Well, if I could just say one thing, Dave Freeze, who is a mentor to us both, he used a word, we had a coaching session, uh, Andy Peterson and, and Mara and myself, we were meeting with Dave and he used this one word and it really kind of shook us to our core. And it's such a simple word, but it's optimal and suboptimal is the opposite. And it really hit us that, you know, for most people, their accounting system as a business system, a system for success is suboptimal. It's not leading, it's, it's lagging, it's not driving, it's drifting. And so he was trying to help us to put into words what our purpose and our mission is. And it's really to help entrepreneurs utilize accounting as a system. And, and if we can help them with that in, in some... How do you mean system. that? Well, again, if, if all it is is to say, you know, um, hold on a second, Tom, last quarter uh, you sucked. That doesn't help you. But if it can say, you know, last quarter you had this, here's where you are now, your goal for next quarter or next month, you're on track, you need to do these things, you need to be able to make some changes. So is it passive and, um, and just something from the past or is it active, is it dynamic? And that's really what we want to be able to do is help you, whether you have a system, you know, like you have DSS for marketing. So more strategic. More- Very much so, yeah. Yeah, and and I know that you know I've talked to you and Don um, mm-hmm. many, many times over the year about your system. Um, and actually, aren't we in the middle of a web project with you guys? Yeah, and and that's part of what's been in a way kind of nice about COVID because it's kind of forced us to strip out some things and think about you know we were focused on all of these all this noise that really wasn't important. When you get really right down to what's important. Right. There are just a few things. It's the 80-20. It's, you know, big doors move on small hinges. And I got kind of caught up like all of us do in all of these other things that are really interesting, but not as important. And so we've actually taken a lot of this time and, and really pulled back and said, how do we do less, but have less be more optimal, more uh, impactful. And so, yeah. um, you know, you're Um, your team, Buster, uh, you know, a phenomenal man. Um, You know, somebody, there's very few people. He's okay. Very few few people in this world that can actually intimidate me, but Buster is one of those, you know. (laughs) um, And and when, you know, I'm in a mastermind. He's a teddy bear. He's a teddy bear. He he is. I tell you, it's funny because I'm in a mastermind with both him and Sam. um, And, you know, both of them can just not say a word. Oh. And, and just rock you to your core. It's like, oh, I I can't, that is just so funny. Like you and those two guys <laughs> with their stoic expressions and you just all over the place like a puppy. Oh, yeah. So Dave, <laughs> Dave, Dave can modulate that, but it's so funny because I'm, you know how I am. Yes. I'm like the little kid, you know, and yeah. on a sugar high and Buster and Sam are both men of very few words but when yes it's something it's, it's like okay. poignant and so That's funny but yeah I mean, it's okay, but we're t- the point we're trying to make a point the point is that um the the what you guys do that sets you apart the from other you know financial vendors mm-hmm. all on that um that take your books and throw you know through put them through some software churn or filter mm-hmm. thing and then spit out a report and say here's your deal and you did terrible <laughs> last quarter and do better when somebody works with you uh you you sit down and you're like well here's where you are where do you want to go yeah and yeah. by when and then you plan with them and and you back it up and 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 so now you guys are on the same page right uh and and you have monthly calls and mm-hmm. and or whenever you want to talk and let them know what they need to be doing each month week day whatever is necessary quarter mm-hmm. to achieve the ultimate goals instead of them trying to catch up to it all the well, time 
and, and honestly, just being able to, to understand what's important because, you know, we talk about five key things, drive five, because this is something that affects every business. And if I stood in front of a thousand business owners right now and said, who wants growth? Who wants cash flow? Who wants optimum profitability, highest value and maximum wealth? Who wants that right now? And everybody would raise their hand. And you can have that, but you can't have all five at the same time. There are trade-offs. And if you're not connected and understand what you're trying to achieve, you know, and the same thing like with your website, if you're trying to just get maximum growth and we'll figure out profitability later, well, then cash flow is impacted. You know, if you have higher growth, you can bring in more cash, but you may also have additional costs. So there are trade-offs. And if you don't understand what those are to prioritize, and, and we could change in that. So right now it could be, you know, I want to create wealth for myself in what I'm taking out of the business. Or it could be I want to take wealth out of the business in the future when it's worth 10x or something like that. And so, but if you don't understand how all these things play, because it's like, oh, I, that's too complex. Well, it's not. Trust me, if I can understand it, I didn't even finish college. So if I can understand it, and, and that's really the, the benchmark, any entrepreneur can understand it and, and understand it in a practical way. It has nothing to do with debits and credits. It has nothing to do with the normal accounting jargon, but it's really about the, the story that your financials are telling. Now, is that story a, a comedy? Is it a horror movie? Is it an action adventure? Um, you know, we, we want Probably to a little bit of all of it. Yeah. Well, and for most, it's going to be, you know, the Horatio Alger, the, you know, the Rocky story, you know, it's, you know, you're, getting pummeled and beat up, but you just kept getting back up and then you figured it out and then you, you went on and you achieved. And, and ultimately the story that we're writing as entrepreneurs and business owners is told through our financials. And when we can get excited about that, instead of looking at it like numbers, like math, you know, math for most of us, unless you're like a, a data nerd, which is, God bless data nerds, but that's not me. Um, I'm, I'm a big picture, you know, just tell me the, how it ends. Was it a boy or a girl? You know, that kind of thing. And most entrepreneurs are like that. You know, I don't want to get caught up in the weeds. If, if a client, you know, wants to get caught up in the weeds, they're probably the wrong client for us. Now, hopefully they have somebody in their business that does want to get caught up in the weeds. You know, if you didn't have a buster that is willing to do some of that, you would be insane. Um, but buster can do some of that and modulate and translate. You know, I speak Tom and I speak, um, the, the accounting people and other things, and he can translate what's there, but ultimately he's affecting your vision through your, your financials. And that's, what's exciting. And that story, you know, from where you are to where you want to go, you're, you know, aligned, calibrated and coordinated with your mission, your vision, your goals, and your entrepreneur ambition. That's yeah. fascinating. Um, and you guys customize it, right? So it's like, you know, um, sit down with them, come up with the plan, customize it. Uh, it's much different than any financial system, certainly that I've heard of before. But typically people have, you know, they look at accounting because we're still kind of caught up in the last century and they look at it kind of binary. You know, I'm either going to hire an employee or I'm going to outsource or, and, and again, they disconnect it. So it's this, um, and there, there's so many parts to it. You know, your payroll is part of this, your, your tax and, and your strategy for how much tax and when you want to pay your, the value of your business, all of that. Again, there's not one part of your business that's not directly tied or, or the story told through your accounting. So when you want to, again, if it's drifting and lagging, that's one thing versus driving and fulfilling your ambition and your mission and the things that you want and letting accounting be a, yeah, you know, we're on track or we're off track and be able to calibrate that to the things that we want to achieve. That's, I think for us is to be able to help business owners and entrepreneurs make this simple and, and saving money is kind of by accident. Um, you know, you and I have both gone to the, you know, Perry Marshall, and he talks about process simplification or price simplification. And, and ultimately, I think what we do is the process simplification, all of the different moving parts and help make it simple through a simple coordination. And again, it has nothing to do with software, you know, whether it's Xero or QuickBooks or FreshBooks, that is kind of irrelevant or an abacus or a spreadsheet, maybe not an abacus, that's hard. But 
when you can tell that story and process simplify, that makes it a lot easier. By, by accident, we kind of also, I think, do a price simplification just because things have changed so much with the software and the ability to make things that used to be very complex and expensive much less now. Uh, you're still going to pay. I mean, there, there's always a part of your growth, a part of your revenue, you know, sometimes three to five percent in accounting all the way from the bookkeeping and reconciliation to tax and strategy. But when you can have that working and all connected and coordinated, it's a much different outcome than this happening over here and silos and this happening. And then hopefully it all works together, you know, but it, sure. it's not how it is. It, we're chefs. We're, you know, we have different ingredients. We have to put it together in the right way and the presentation of it all and then the enjoyment. So how does, um, well, let me ask you this question before I ask you that question. Sure. So as you know, we're in the, we're in the middle. Well, who knows <laughs> if we're in the middle, we're in some stage of this pandemic. Right. Uh, and, um, you and I haven't seen each other since last October. October yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, and, uh, it's good to see you. You lost 30 pounds. You look good. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. The COVID um, diet, uh, don't get the COVID on. diet. Yeah. And so, um, uh, we were kind of talking about how different businesses, including our own businesses mm -hmm. have, have, have handled this. So what is your what's your opinion what's your take on on a lot of the law firms um obviously you're very close to the and i don't you know i'm just kind of looking for just your thoughts overall because yeah. i know that you manage thousands yeah there's i think a big mindset shift <clears throat> is really again whether it's a you know a fear and scarcity versus okay we're in it um and let's let's do the very best we can to refine the situation and however it presents itself. And the clients that we see that are taking that action, um, even some, some of them are actually um, stripping away some, some business to focus on higher, higher quality, higher uh, productivity business. And so that the choices that we have right now in some ways is still a gift. Um, it's hard to look at it when we're in the middle of some of this, um, the unknown, but it feels right now where we are sitting here at the middle part of August that we are hopefully on the, the upswing of this. And so I think the, the entrepreneurs, and again, we've learned this from Dave Freeze and being able to just take action now is going to put us so much further ahead than those that are just kind of waiting to see like, oh, well, let me see if it's safe to go back in the water. Well, it's never safe to go back in the water. We, we always have, there will always be something. So Let's just make the best of this now and, and learn from each other and help each other. Let us always love each other. Lead us to the light. Yeah, I agree. I mean, and, you know, I talked to Dave early on mm -hmm. uh, when a couple times. Well, I talked to him obviously before all of this and then kind of right when it happened. And yeah. And and others, but um, it, it's interesting because yeah, I'm with you. We've had um, clients that just you know shit the bed and said, "I can't take it," and I'm I'm out. <laughs> um, it's too and, bad. Yeah, and then uh, we've had others that um, kind of uh, went into hiding, I think, for a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, they like stocked up to, you know, just to put all their acorns <laughs> under the tree and to see what happened. And, you know, they're kind of coming out now, um, you know, fearfully they're afraid. Um, but then you've got the, and I think you always have those people mm -hmm. no matter what. Right. Um, and then you've got the, um, the the winners that really they they pivot they uh they're like 
they take they're like okay well shit it is what it is I, you know i hate to say it is what it is these days but um they take what they got and um they make a move and yeah. you know we call it pivoting and uh they they like what you were saying instead of having 10 practice areas they've got uh, you know, that fed them a stream of business. Now they can only do two or three. And, mm -hmm. and now they're focusing way more on those things. Right. And it, 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 you know, people still need their lawyers and they need their lawyers now more than ever. That's and true. and um, uh, now's the time for good lawyers, smart lawyers to stand up and market themselves because mm -hmm. people are going to the web certainly more than ever. Mm -hmm. And certainly for a certain kind of estate planning has exploded. Yes. People are all checking that stuff. I, I, um, we, uh, of course, DUI is down. <laughs> um, I don't, I don't think that's a bad thing. Sorry. <laughs> right. Um, it's interesting just as a side note about that. And this is nothing, you know, I got a lot of DUI lawyer clients, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's a great business. We'll, I'm sure it'll come back. People will be raving lunatics <laughs> again. Don't worry. But remember when um, you couldn't, when you ordered online, you couldn't, you could order your food, but you couldn't order booze. Now, sure, no problem. Mm -hmm. What's the difference? Before they were like, no, come on down. Order as much booze as you can so you can drive home drunk. We don't care. We actually, we prefer that, <laughs> but it. now, you know, it's just funny how there's a pivot. Mm -hmm. Well, even looking at your client segments, looking at, um, you know, again, a lot of us get caught up in, you know, growth for growth sake. And we were certainly guilty of this. And we made a decision. Um, this is right before COVID happened. So we were already kind of in that where we actually let some clients go because it just wasn't a good fit for us. Um, they didn't either, they didn't appreciate what our staff and our team was doing. They just looked at us as a commodity and we thought we're, we're not a commodity and we're not gonna be treated that way. And we could do more for clients for that just clients. really wanted to, to do big things. You know, our, our ideal client is somebody who said, you know, I have ambition and, and, and mission that's bigger than my um, you know, I'm out driving my headlights. It's bigger than my, my current plan. I don't know how I'm going to achieve this, but if I have the right team, the right people and the right advisor group, we'll, we'll figure it out. And that may be a little bit too far for some to be comfortable with, but the ones who are, you know, I just, you know, I want incremental. My goal is to suck a little less this year than last year. That's, we're not a great fit for those clients. I mean, it's just, I'm sorry, they're, they're great. And, you, you know, to me, there's a big difference between a business owner and a practice builder than somebody who's an entrepreneur who also practices law or somebody who has that. And, and you see, like, uh, Business Black Ops, Dave has a number of clients that he works with that are, are really, I would call entrepreneurs. They may not see themselves that way, but they're entrepreneurs who practice law. Um, you know, they're fantastic and, and they really are big thinkers versus, no, I just, I just want to suck a little less this year than last year. I just want to be comfortable, you know, poke my head out a little bit and go back in. Is there you know, any of those guys? In, is there any of those guys in business black ops? I don't think so. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny because there are a lot of us that are wired differently. Um, you know, they're, you know, um, like some of the, the crazy people. They're too hungry. Everybody's too hungry in business black ops. Yeah. They're all crazy. They, they are, but it's kind of a different, like I learned from your crazy differently than like a Larry's yeah. crazy or even a Dr. Wyman who's not crazy because he is a doctor, but, he's, but there's some crazy. He's crazy. He's just got it. He's just like, yeah. it's okay. Cause he's got like doctor. <laughs> so people are like, it's okay. He's a doctor. What's so great about that group and what Dave brings together. And, and it's, it's exciting because we're at the time right now where, you know, it's right around the corner. And I know some people are going to be scared and like, oh, I don't want to go. I'm, I'm in. I mean, I'm going. Are you going? Absolutely. I'm going. Andy's coming this year too. So. Oh, good. I, Is he flying you? No, we're not. Not yet. That's kind of the next. I, I was wondering if you're going to go in the private jet with Andy, your personal pilot. No. 
it's funny because, you know, Andy and I joke because I'm a pilot as well. I've had my pilot's license since That's I was 16. Cool. That's so cool. But, but I haven't flown for a number of years. Um, so my, my hours is somewhere between 100 and 200. Andy has less than four, like around 4,000. So we kind of joke like, yeah, between Andy and myself, we have about 4,000 hours, you know. You know, Andy, how many hours do you have? It's like 3,900. <laughs> so that just tells you about statistics. Don't ever trust statistics. Yeah, because, I know, like that, though. That's we average good. our hours together, or, you know, a couple thousand each. But, you know, you would, not want, you would not want me to be your pilot in command right now. So I'm pretty sure I could land this thing. I mean, no, I what, think what's that, the worst that could happen? Yeah, no, I'm, I, I'm, I'll, I'll stick with Andy. Yeah, you definitely should on, on so many levels. But uh, yeah, that, well, that'll be good to get the group together. Hopefully, yeah. we'll still keep that that going. That's that's around the corner. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so I wanted to ask you another question. Yes. Uh, so if uh, we have a lot of lawyers well, and doctors, but mm-hmm. we have a lot of lawyers that listen to this, um, and if they are so inclined to. Um, reach out or would like to reach out to talk to you about help with their accounting um, or just talk to you about how you can help them? How how would they do that, Frank? Well, probably the easiest thing is just to go to kahunaaccounting.com. And from there, there's a number of different free resources and tools and and just how we work because how we work is so different. I I kind of joke and I think I'm accurate about this, but I have no way of proving it. So But I think 99% of all the accounting businesses that are out there in the world were started because somebody was great with and loves accounting. We're the 1% that started because I hated accounting and didn't understand it and I made all these mistakes. So we had to back into how do we make accounting for people like me and other legitimate... I I just shared the screen of your website. It's like, whoa, something... I just had my system redone, so I was afraid that I lost you there. Just whacked, just whacked <laughs> the whole thing. Oh, no. But to be able to, um, I kind of lost my, my thought there for a second. Sorry. Okay. okay <laughs> I'm going to make a political and say I pulled the Joe Biden, but I, I wouldn't want to do that. So that's just. <laughs> wow, well, showing off your website, which threw you off. And it was like how to get in touch with you mm-hmm. to get some uh, to get some help, right? Because most most accounting firms are really about accounting, right? Not, that's what about, it was about entrepreneurship and building a business, building a practice. And again, I think if there's one thing that that we really want to do, whether somebody works with us or not, and I'd love to have conversations regardless, is just helping to get back to you know what is your mission, vision. Your, your goals and your ambition and how do you make a system utilizing accounting as, as part of that tool. Again, it's not about the tool, but using the tool to just make sure that you're calibrated and connected and aligned back to that mission, vision, goals, and ambition. And that's really what we want accounting to be as a practical tool there. So um, I'm really grateful for just this opportunity to talk to you and, and reconnect about some of these things, because again, we we kind of fell into some of our business in a way and have had to adapt from it. I know your story, your backstory, um, you know, you, it's not what you set out to do, but it's like, hey, it kind of worked and then it, it, it evolved. But if at some point you didn't make a, a strong stand to say, this is what I want it to be, it would have just continued to, to drift and, you know, who knows where you'd be. Uh, that's a whole nother totally. thing, that uh, the mess of my business, although it's been pretty good uh, for, for many years since, since I, you know, you said them Buster, since mm-hmm. I got a great partner in Buster who what kind of, uh, don't tell him this, but he kind of, he kind of tamed the beast a little bit mm-hmm. and settled us down and got us, got us, uh, but I wanted to point this website out. This is not a foster website. That's in, that's in production. Right. Long production time, a long production cycle, unusually long, right, Frank? And that's, I have to take full ownership of that because we've changed a number of times. Well, there's, when we first start talking, you know, I talked about the drive five, five things. Okay, wait, get ready. There's driving growth, 
Okay. Cash flow and profitability to maximize the value of your, your business or your enterprise as a foundation for wealth. And so we started focusing on value and looking at how we could do this because valuation is something that's very different. It's what really hurt me that I didn't know. And so we started going down this path and then we've still want to do that, but it's brought in other things. So I created the a little bit of complexity and had to pull, pull us back so that we could do the, the essential piece best as we start going forward again first. Cool. Well, we want to catch you on this, on this cycle and like, just get the damn thing published and then you can go change it all around again. Um, but okay. So, uh, everybody, if you would like to talk to, uh, Frank, uh, I can tell you right now that, um, I've known Frank for many, many years and there's not, there's a handful of guys like him. Um, he's just genuine, genuine person, man of his word. Um, give you the shirt off his back and um, help you out. And uh, had a lot of great chats with him and uh, a lot of great times and couldn't recommend so many more. Thank you. Um, so Frank, thank you so much thank for you. hanging out with me on the world of marketing. And uh, we'll have to do it again when yes. this website gets published. Because I think that we've got some other things planned. Nice. Uh, with it that we've talked about. And of course, we'll be seeing each other here in a couple of, yes. I think. About a month and a half. Short weeks. Yeah. I guess I probably should get my flights going here since Andy can't fly us right now. Yeah, I guess we should get that squared away. <laughs> Okay, buddy. Well, you're looking good. Thank you so much, Frank. All right, everybody. It's been the Frank and Tom show here on the world of marketing. Everybody stay safe and wear your damn masks. All right. See you later.